Hello, everyone. My name is Jia Yi Zhang. Call me Iris as well. I'm an undergraduate student from the University of Toronto. Today, I'm very thrilled to share my latest work, Complementary Dynamics at SIGGRAPH Asia 2020. It's a truly collaborative work, which won't be possible without my collaborator, Sang Bei Bang, and also my amazing advisors, Professor Dave Levin and Professor Alec Jacobson. So let's take a look together how complementary dynamics works. When it comes to realistic character animation, there has been this so-called principles of animation or say the foundations of animation. Specifically in this work, we are focusing on identifying the right relationship between primary and secondary motion. So what do those mean? If you pay attention to these two simple animation and make some comparisons, you will notice that the primary motion is actually clearly defined as this cat jumping motion, while the secondary motion means the natural follow through of the cat's whiskers as well as its tail. But now the question becomes, given the primary motion, how could we actually achieve the secondary motion effectively? people want control over the animation, so they might make it fully animated. This is a good idea since the methods are usually purely geometric and the animator could do whatever they want within the design space. However, this is also not great since it requires a fair amount of creativity and could also be labor and time consuming. Moreover, it would be extra difficult if the goal is to achieve very complex motion. Well, on the other hand, people love physical simulation, so my wish this could be fully simulated. The pros and cons of this approach are obvious too. For example, to simulate the behavior of deformable solids, people usually use FEM-based or MPM-based methods. While the physical accuracy could be maintained and sometimes get happy surprises, there is no direct control or artistic intention acted on the animation. Additionally, to find the best suitable physical parameters and the initial conditions, the iterations usually take long and the process could be quite expensive. After seeing the two extremes, you might want to ask, is it possible that we do simulation under artistic control? And the answer is yes. There have been existing cool papers which attempted to combine simulation and animation, and I love them all. However, by examining these methods carefully, we observe that the existing method somehow puts these two roles on a false linear spectrum, which means the artist and the physical simulation are put into the adversarial roles. For example, the rig space physics paper constrains the displacement of secondary effects to lie in the subspace spanned by the artist's rig. To have interesting secondary effects, it requires augmenting the rig with new auxiliary degrees of freedom. And we will show later this is on the exact opposite of our method. As an instance, if you want to say detailed movements of each individual spine on the hedgehog's body, you kind of have to put so many additional handles to expand the original rig space. Similarly, if you modify the rest of the ship, this is even more like making the animator and simulator batting with each other in a sense of minimizing an elastic energy, which exerts forces pushing the ship back to its reference configuration away from the artist's pose. Also, this can cause catastrophic failure if the rig pose creates a physically impossible or infinite energy configuration. Up to here, a paradox seems to appear. The artist's rig displacement can be treated as hard constraints. Otherwise, physics has no room for secondary effects. Meanwhile, physics cannot have too much freedom so as to undo the artist's work. Instead, we advocate that creative primary effects and the physical secondary effects are not contra 
contradictory, but rather they are complementary. We are going to show this observation is not just true conceptually or philosophically, but also algebraically, such that the animation artists can use low dimensional rigs to control the primary motion and rely on our complementary dynamics framework to add interesting elastodynamic secondary effects. So how does our method work? The core idea in this displacement filtering approach, which enables physics only acts orthogonally to the artistic rig, or say physics lies in the local orthogonal complement of the space spent by the rig. The nice thing about this complementary space is that it's high dimensional and algebraically constructed without many oversets. We quickly point out that this space is only slightly smaller than the full simulation space in terms of the number of degree of freedoms. Hence, it's capable of rich high frequency dynamics. As you may know, there are so many different types of rig methods ranging from linear ones like linear blind skinning, homotic coordinates, to nonlinear ones like dual quaternion skinning or wire deformer, which are commonly built in commercial animation softwares, so on and so forth. However, instead of thinking of how to deal with those individually, we generally treat them as a mapping from some low dimensional rig parameters to the mesh vertex positions like from this P to UR. So the input to our method is just a generalized rig function. At the same time, we treat artists' input as a sequence of such rig parameters. At each frame T, given the input rig displacement, we are expecting to achieve this vivid final displacement. So now the question is, how to find the most satisfying complementary displacement as a difference. Like most simulation papers, we start from the time integration. You are given the potential energy where the psi function could represent any physical model without losing generality. You are also given an inertia term. In the paper, we use the most stable implicit Euler integrator as an example. But in theory, any reasonable time integrator just works here, such as the implicit new mark, if you want the energy to be better preserved. Combining those two, the displacement finding problem for each frame is literally just an optimization problem, which is usually nonlinear due to the elasticity potential. And to suit our needs, we need to do this change of variable. So now the direct output becomes a complementary displacement. However, if you blindly solve this unconstrained minimization problem, the physics is just so aggressive such that it will completely undo the rig pose. Instead, we propose that, say the rig spends such a space, the intuition is to constrain the complementary displacements you see to only those displacements that could not be created by the original rig. Mathematically speaking, given the current rig parameters PT, we can verify any candidate displacement you see satisfies this criterion by ensuring that projecting to the closest rig displacement simply recovers PT. This looks somewhat scary because there is an argument operation appearing in the constraint. Fortunately, by enforcing the first order necessary condition, the daunting nonlinear constraint could be greatly simplified up to a linear constraint. We encourage you to read our paper for more details about this derivation. As a result, at each frame t, we compute the local tangent space and restrict the complementary displacement only lives in the space orthogonal to that. That is to say, we are required to compute the Jacobian of rig displacement with respect to the rig control parameters. So instead of solving an unconstrained minimization problem, we optimize the original objective function subject to our orthogonality constraint. If you plot the contour lines of the dynamic objective, we are looking for a local minimum within the feasibility space. Compared to the typical simulation pipeline, at each frame, 
we are given the rate displacement u r do this change of variable, and then we update the rate Jacobian correspondingly. Solve a constraint minimization problem instead, and finally recover the final displacement and repeat the process frame by frame. It's just so simple. In terms of how to actually solve this nonlinear optimization problem with an equality constraint, in the most examples in our paper, we use the constraint Newton's method. It requires us to first update the gradient Hessian, and then use the multi-weapon Lagrange multiplier to build and solve the according KKT system, and finally do line search to find the optimal step size. For specific type of elastic energies, such as as rigid as possible and mass spring system, we use this ADMM type of solvers. As a local step, you basically do whatever is described in the original paper. And then as a global step, solving a constrained quadratic programming problem to incorporate the linear hard constraint. So for instance, like this mass spring roller coaster man. To demonstrate how this simple additional constraint can work, we tested on a variety of different examples. To begin with, we show it works for any rig type. Here we show a flying bird rigged with bone handles. And here is the result after applying our complementary dynamics. If you do the side-by-side -side comparison, you will notice that how our methods add high frequency motions to the feathers that could not be achieved by simply moving the bones. And here we show a cage-based deformer rigged with harmonic coordinate applied to a virus. And here is the enriched result after applying our method. Look at the rich details of the dynamics on the body. As I mentioned before, our method also works for the nonlinear rig, like this daisy flower rigged by Catamo Rom's blind. See how this daisy becomes cheerful when the bee is coming close to it. It also holds for this 3D dual quaternion scanning example. Notice that our complementary dynamics automatically smooths out the bulging artifacts of dual quaternion scanning. The same is true for rigid body simulations. We could add secondary effects to post process a rigid body simulation and make it look more elastic without needing to rerun collision detection or change the overall scattering of objects. And here is a zoom in wheel, and you could say how precisely the position is preserved. We also show adding an additional constraint doesn't affect the ability for material editing and handling contact with the environment. Our method inherits advantages of whichever elasticity model it is plugged into. Material parameters can be controlled just like a full space simulation. We also test our method on the mocap data. A motion capture sequence controls a skeleton rig inside an elephant. The trunk and ears are not articulated by the skeleton so freely receive lively secondary effects. Here is the same model with softer material. It's even more energetic. Our master could handle background force. K-frame animation provides the primary motion of this amoeba. 
but secondary responses to external forces bring it to life. Even with this simple input motion, our master enriches alpha transformation with dynamics. And same for the contact forces. Notice the subtle dynamical detail when banana holding blumper hits the ground. And here we show two rigged arms punching with each other with collision forces. You can clearly see the wave traveling through the arm. And it also works in 3D. Apart from volumetric FEM based simulation, we also test our master on cloth simulation. Here we show a carpet simply rigged with two point handles. And here is the enhanced result with our master. Look how complementary dynamics makes it full of life. In the end, we compare our method with some previous approaches. Here, we compare with Rigsby's physics, which rely on auxiliary degrees of freedoms to enrich the physical space. Here, we visualize them by the white dots. In contrast, our method adds rich details of dynamics on top of the original rig. Another common approach for combining physical simulation and animation is to have geometrically embedded rigid bones to drive the volumetric mesh, which usually requires meaningful geometric bones. For example, with this input motion of elephant trunk, with rigid bar embedded, it shows awkward kinks around the joint, while our master interprets the rig as an action on the ship directly. In addition, tracking-based methods track input animations by weak constraints defined over patches. The output is sensitive to the distribution and number of patches. Problems occur at either extreme. As you could say, it shows poor tracking when cluster number is small, but shows too steep result when there are too many clusters. Finding a good balance is an additional burden for the user. Our method does not require clustering at all. Finally, we have tested our system with complex set of rigs made by professional artists. We downloaded this complex linear rig that contains 50 bones. Despite the large rig space, our master still finds room for interesting secondary dynamics. As for the limitation and future work, we have to say, unfortunately, complementary dynamics is not complementary. By the time we submitted this work, we focused more on presenting our method with this generality and did not optimize the, op the performance. In this case, fast complementary dynamics could be an interesting future work for the community, and we are excited about integrating it into the live performance environments. Also, we attended the SIGGRAPH 2020 this year and inspired by this dynamic talk from Pixar. Many real-world characters are composed of multiple components, and we are looking forward to extending our master to layer-based simulation. To conclude, we reiterate, complementary dynamics turn physics simulation into the artist's respectful partner rather than an unruly party crusher. So we thank all our sponsors, as well as my co-authors, Thank you everyone for watching.